All right. Yeah, rock stars who tried to save Alice in Chains, Lane Staley. Um, it still blows my mind the tragedy that surrounds the Seattle bands. It's it's unbelievable. You find a new one, and then it's like there's some just sadness and tragedy and darkness that surrounds these boys. Um, but yeah, this is uh, who tried to save Alice in Chains. Well, I know one because I watched that little documentary about Alice in Chains. One was, it was one of the members of the band. It might have been Jerry Cantrell. Uh, but yeah, let's go. From 1996 to 2002, Alice in Chains frontman Lane Staley lived a pretty reclusive life. If you've read either Grunge is Dead or Everybody Loves Our Town, there's a handful of pretty depressing stories of what Lane was like in his reclusive years and how his appearance had drastically changed from years of drug abuse. It was during this time, especially towards the tail end of his life, that several of his musician friends and bandmates tried to help him get clean. That's what we're going to explore in today's video. It was either around 1999 or 2000 that Bob Forrest and John Frusciante tried to help convince Lane Staley to get off drugs. Forrest would be best known for his work in Los Angeles bands Thelonious Monster and The Bicycle Thief. Forrest, who dealt with addiction, previously became known as a person who could get through to addicts, and Staley's mom asked him for his help. Forrest would recount the story in his book Running With Monsters, a memoir. Also with him during this time was Red Hot Chili Peppers' John Frusciante, who was newly sober, but he didn't think he could get through to Staley, but joined Forrest anyways in visiting Lane at his apartment in Seattle. Forrest would write in his book how the conversation went going, Hey Lane, what's going on? To which Lane responded, Nothing. I know why you're here. To which Bob responded, Your mom's worried, man. You don't look too good. Lane would respond, I'm okay though, really. After leaving Lane's apartment, Forrest would remark to Frashanti in his book, I don't think he'll come out of this, to which Frashanti responded, it's his life, man. Former Screaming Trees frontman Mark Lanigan would talk to Rolling Stone in 2020 and discuss getting sober in the late 90s and trying to help his friend Lane Staley. He would tell Rolling Stone, the first time I saw him referring to Lane and trying to help his friend Lane Staley. Mark Lanigan on why Kurt Cobain's death still haunts him, how Courtney's love saved his life. How Courtney love saved his life. He would tell Rolling Stone, the first time I saw him referring to Lane after I gotten clean, I've been clean a year. I'm pretty sure that Allison Chains, Jerry Cantrell, and Mike Inez flew me up to Seattle because they were unable to get into his house. He had a camera and lived in the penthouse of this condo, so whenever anybody from his camp would come to see him, he would just ignore it. Jerry and Mike knew that when he saw me, he would let me in. And I also wanted him to see that I was clean, that it was possible to get clean, that his prediction that I would never be able to do it had failed. Hopefully, maybe it would give him the idea that he himself could do it, but he didn't want to do it. When I got there, I said, hey man, it's been a while. I've been clean for more than 12 months. And he was like, no, you weren't, man. You just left like two months ago. His sense of time had warped and he wasn't buying the truth from me. I remember him saying at that point, I always just keep thinking I'm gonna get the same feeling I got the first time again. Lanigan would go on to say that he hoped a medical emergency would force Lane to change his ways, but that medical emergency ended up being his death. Finally, his bandmates, more specifically drummer Sean Kinney and Mike Inez tried to help Lane. And Inez would reveal in the book how he himself and Mark Lanigan would go beat on his door to talk to Lane from time to time, but to no avail. Kinney, meanwhile, would tell an interviewer, It got to a point where he kept himself so locked up both physically and emotionally. I kept trying to make contact three times a week like clockwork. I'd call him, but he'd never answer. Every time I was in the area, I was up in front of his place yelling for him. Even if he could get into his building, he wasn't going to open the door. He'd phone and he would never answer. You could just kick the door in and grab him, though there were so many times I thought about doing that. But if someone won't help themselves, what really can anyone else do? Nirvana bassist Chris Novoselic would sometimes take food over to Lane's house, hoping to save the frontman after losing his friend Kurt Cobain. In the book Grunge is Dead, Krisha Augero, who worked for Pearl Jam, singled out Alice in Chains' as manager and Chris Cornell's wife at the time, Susan Silver, as being the person who tried to help Lane the most straighten out his life, recalling she was a constant in his life trying to get him clean. Unfortunately, he just never accepted it. Sadly, Lane would pass away on April 5th, 2002, eight years from the day Kurt Cobain died due to a drug overdose. His body wouldn't be discovered until two weeks later after his accountants noticed that no cash withdrawals had been made from his account and no one had heard from him. If you guys have suggestions for future topics you'd like to see me cover, use the link in the description box below. And we'll see you again in Rock and Ultra Stories. Take care. That's mad. 
it is it's so like is it, I mean Kurt Cobain's the famous one but it's amazing how you go into these stories and they're just all like the dark drug addict um, lifestyle basically but to just lock himself away and I guess like having money and always having a constant flow of money he can't have been spending that much on anything other than drugs so he just had a non-stop supply and he didn't have to go anywhere right it's, it's yeah the, it's just it's it's, it's um, like amazing how dark and sad that that area's bands were and Mark Lanigan I've not got to that far in the book yet Lane Stady has come up in the book but yeah I don't know if it's going to go all the way up to there but I'm guessing that might have even been from his book I don't know if he wrote another one or what but I'm guessing that's from the book I'm listening to what he read out then um, and it's kind of mad that he turned out to be someone who went clean because from listening to his book I don't think, I didn't think he's ever going to get clean. I thought he was going to be a junkie rocker his whole life. Um, Mark Lanigan, I mean. Yeah, madness. Madness. But the fact is, is whatever, whoever said it in that was saying, if someone doesn't want to, if they don't want to do it, there's nothing you can do and the comedian Mitch Hedberg is kind of something I respect about him as well as far as drug users go what I respect about um, Mitch Hedberg yeah the comedian is he kind of made it clear to his friends and family because he was a heroin addict and he was like I love doing this and I'm going to do it until it kills me and I think at least that's kind of like owning it and it seems like Lane Staley was in their same headspace he might not have worded it like that but yeah crazy but anyway that's the reaction sweet <laughs>